Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Mr. Kenny Shu, author of Inconvenient Minority and President of Color Us United. Kenny, good day, welcome to Indisputable. Thanks for having me. All right, so we're going to chop it up about critical race theory, affirmative action, and maybe also get into the movement to stop Asian hate. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about these topics. So if you would, give us some background to your perspective as it relates to critical race theory. Well, I care about race, I care about racism. I care about efforts to fight racism. Um, but now we have a new racism, an elite racism uh, against Asian Americans that is being done in the name of diversity and inclusion. Um, I know you care about and your listeners care a lot about uh, racism, but I wanna take it a step further. and I wanna challenge your listeners a little bit because what happens when a program designed to address racism, which is Harvard's and Ivy League colleges affirmative action programs, which give racial preferences to black and Latino Americans unfairly impinge upon the rights of other Americans, including other minorities. In this case, these are Asian Americans in which Asian Americans are have to score 440 points higher on the SAT to have the same chance of admission as a black person at Harvard. So at this point, you're getting one person's rights to diversity and inclusion trampling upon another person's rights. And I don't think that that's fair. You know, that's interesting. And I've read some of your work about the Harvard University discrimination practices or or the element that connects Harvard University to even more extreme discrimination when it was trying to do the opposite, or at least that was that that was the intent. Mm-hmm. And I studied some of this a couple of years ago <clears throat> in my doctoral classes. So I'm familiar with it. But <clears throat> how does that relate to critical race theory or, or does it not relate at all? Well, it suggests that Asian Americans are an inconvenient minority to critical race right. theory, right? Because critical race theory, you know, it it asserts and there are varying definitions of critical race theory and but in in large part it is a challenge to the western liberal idea of, you know, equal rights, individual rights, critical race theory prefers to look at people in terms of, of, of racial groups in that sense. But the, the issue of looking and then granting certain preferences to people of racial groups is that, especially in the case of Harvard, but also in the case of other Ivy League colleges, elite public schools like Thomas Jefferson High School. When you're trying to enact diversity and inclusion in favor of one race, you are trampling against the rights of another race. Okay. So I think that this is this is how it's relevant to critical race theory because Asian Americans have simply become a minority that is ignored within this framework because they are successful at their educational standards. Well, let me push back on that because I think yeah. you're conflating two things that don't necessarily go together. You're talking on one side about the theoretical framework, which is critical race theory. Critical race theory includes any group that's not part of the mainstream social order of dominance or authority in that system. Um, the application or the um, implementation of the remedy or supposed remedy by a particular agency does not um, speak to critical race theory. I think you're making critical race theory a villain here when the truth is in its purest form, critical race theory as a theoretical framework poses a question and it uh, encourages you to analyze or critically think. And it says based on the systems that were created, even if you were to eliminate racism or individual racist people, you would still have unequal outcomes in the United States of America because of how the systems were created and they were created rooted in bias. I think it's something that you and I can agree with. Consider Asian Americans a marginalized group. Say that again. Does critical race theory consider Asian Americans a marginalized group? It does, yes. Okay, so if you want to help a marginalized group like Asian Americans, right? Mm-hmm. You would want to at least not unfairly impinge upon their rights to admissions to colleges, right? But okay. the issue is when you create a program that gives racial preferences to certain races like okay. blacks and Hispanics, you are impinging the rights 
of Asian Americans, another marginalized group. So let me ask you this, you're okay with the with the dynamic, you're saying it's not as inclusive as it should be to our Asian brothers and sisters, is, is that your point? Well, that's one angle in which I can come from, yeah. Okay, but but is that your angle? Is that the point you're making about some of these institutions and their application of diversity inclusion? Yes. Okay. So I think that's a fair point. Um, I don't think many of these institutions or even agencies, especially corporate America, are doing it properly. So you don't get any debate here from me about that. I don't think anybody has done it uh, holistically properly. But I do believe that the analysis of critical race theory is still an important analysis to understand the what, to understand why did we get here in the first place? Why is there a challenge in the inequity um, and the origin of that inequity? I think that's important to examine if you actually want to get to a remedy. You can't yeah, throw out that examination, mm-hmm. correct? And, that, and that's fine. Um, that's fine of using a, a critical race theory analysis. But the Asian American challenge to the critical race theory analysis is okay, well, if America is a country mm-hmm. that is founded upon white supremacy, why would a group of white supremacists let a group of minorities, which are Asian Americans, get ahead of them? in things like educational attainment and things like average household income. Asian Americans are higher than whites in both. And I don't think that a white supremacist structure or a structure based in white supremacy would allow a minority to get ahead of them. So let me get this right. The, the, the answer just- to me is that, that, that America, uh, that the answer to me is that mm-hmm. is that America cannot be a country that is continually having white supremacist structures if, if it allows these kinds of inconvenient facts to, to come. Okay. That's really interesting. You're utilizing the microcosm to explain a macrocosm. In doing so, you invalidate the not only statistical data, but the personal stories of black Americans all throughout this country. So let me give you another perspective here, okay? Um, Stanford University did a study. Berkeley University did a study. University of Chicago did a study. University of California did a study. Um, they did a research study that had the exact same result. It showed that individuals who had either foreign sounding names or what they called black sounding names and what employers called ghetto sounding names, they received fewer callbacks. As a matter of fact, they received 50% fewer callbacks from the would be employer. These were Fortune 500 companies where these applications went. All of these applications were fictitious. When they changed the name, it's called whitening the resume. When they changed the name and kept every other educational and experiential credential in its place. These companies called back with a rate of 50% higher or more. That's that fine, and by the way, I've seen the same studies about Asian Americans too. You have a, I just said four sounds of names. Thing. Asian that Americans were included like, in this study, sir. Well, okay. So the the point is the point is of course there is um, of course there is discrimination and racism. Of course, I care about that a lot. But you have you know races, Black Americans who have historically been discriminated against, Asian Americans who have historically been discriminated against, and yet. Asian Americans are enabled to, in large part, on average, live pretty healthy, successful lives in terms of these kinds of things. And and that cannot be explained by a critical race theory framework. Because well, that it is. goes deep down into culture and hard work. And those are things that you have to consider as well. You know, I, I do find it quite interesting. And I, I do appreciate your commentary about it. I do find it quite interesting um, that because there are some dynamics, obviously, um, as to um, Asian American success, in which I agree and and applaud that that because of those dynamics of success, in in some way, according to your narrative, it invalidates the white supremacy that exists against uh, Black and Brown people in the United States. You do realize that Asian hate crimes are up by 169 percent. Now, do you not think that that has an attribution to white supremacy in the United States of America? Okay, Asian anti-Asian crimes Anti, are up 90 yeah. percent. But here's the thing: 28 percent of those crimes against Asian Americans were perpetrated by Black Americans. 25 percent of them were perpetrated by White Americans. So there's actually more anti-Asian crimes by from Black Americans than from White Americans. So how is you know that? What? Let me tell you this, brother. I've been I've an been advocate for the Asian community for years. 
You can go on my uh, Facebook feed right now. Yeah. Anybody can check it out right now. Rashad Richie Facebook page. When I uh, stand with the Asian community, I have black folk and white folk calling me out for doing so. Anti-Asian, hey, you gotta remember it is institutional and systemic. There are a whole lot of black folks that think like white supremacists. Mm -hmm. Candace Owens, Jesse Lee Peterson, Larry Elder. I can go down the list, brother. So you so can you're listen saying to me. white oh, supremacy hold on, hold on, brother. Really I'm gonna explain about myself. I will explain my point of view. Kenny, you finish. Go ahead. What, what were you saying? Because obviously what you're so saying you is said, more important. Uh, you said uh, you said that white supremacy exists in people like Candace Owens. So white supremacy isn't really about the skin color of the person then. White supremacy, sir, and I say this often on my show, Candace Owens is, is the number one white black supremacist uh, in America. White supremacy is an ideology, it's an ideological framework as well, rooted obviously in skin color, that's your genesis. It's rooted in an idea, a philosophy, a narrative that suggests somehow that white skin makes you privileged. But that white skin that supposedly makes you privileged also creates a psychological dynamic inside of those individuals that has been mimicked by others that do not have that white skin. We have had this dynamic for years. That dynamic is, include, is included in damn near every culture in the United States of America and beyond. There are so people that are not the narrative. People who disagree to me, with brother, you listen to me, think brother. Like white supremacists. There, there are people who adopt the narrative of their oppressors all the time. Uh huh. Right. So people who disagree with you are white supremacists. No. You disagree with me. You're not a white supremacist, I don't believe. Well, I don't I don't think I am. Okay, but, but you just said that people disagree Candace with Owens me. A white supremacist. Wait a minute, Kenny. You just said that people disagree with me. They are white supremacists. No, you disagree with me. I don't think you're a white supremacist. I don't think you are promoting white supremacy. I just think you're misguided and misinformed about the plight of black folks in the United States of America. And also, if you look at statistical data, even from Asian Americans, 81% of Asian Americans believe that there is a rise of white supremacy hate against Asians. You're in the minority as it relates to your own community, brother. That's you. I'm not calling you. A white supremacist for that, but you're not in the majority as it relates to the thinking of the Asian culture. Well, I care about the facts, and I prefer to take a look at the facts and objective realities as they are. Yep. And the objective realities is that the Asian American proves an American success story. This is a story that should be celebrated because a minority is able to achieve, and minorities are able to achieve in this country. By the way, plenty of Black Americans also achieve in this country. In fact, the Black graduation rate for Black women is higher than for white people. People don't know that. The graduation rate failures are largely attributed to, um, unfortunately, black men who were born into single parent families. And so these are Kenny, issues let me push back on that facts that we need set. to talk about as well. If we're gonna talk about critical Kenny, we're gonna talk that about another data set talk about that the you dream. Let's Go talk ahead. about something you ignored. Uh, black women are now the fastest growing um, demographic in the United States of America, not only for graduation, but also for uh, business ownership, entrepreneurship, fastest growing, okay, out of every race in the United States. Black women are also the least paid based on their counterpart with the same education and same experience of a white male. They are not only the least paid, they are also the least likely, likely to receive promotion with the same education or even more education. They are paid 68 cents on the dollar of their white male counterpart. These are actual statistics as well that you conveniently ignore when you when you promote a stat that fits your narrative. The truth is the graduation rates, they are increasing, but the job market is still saying that we engage in discriminatory activity against these particular individuals. How do you reconcile the numbers of increased graduation, which means increased education, to the fact that black women can't even get as much money for the same experience and education as their white counterpart. They can't get a call back because their names sound black on the resume and they're discriminated against historically as it relates to promotions in the workplace well, more I so than any other demographic in the United States. Well, I, I, I don't ignore those statistics. In fact, I know that Asian men, especially men who come here with language barriers, actually face a 25% wage penalty in comparison to native born men here. So I'm, I am not unaware of these statistics. But my solution, which I lay out in my book, An Inconvenient Minority, is not for people to 
uh, passive aggressively uh, victim self victimize themselves, but for them to go and be entrepreneurs to start their own businesses. Part of the reason why black women are so good at starting their own businesses is because of sort of this ignorance in the workforce. And I totally understand that. And I encourage a lot of my Asian American community, especially Asian men to also go out and start their own businesses. I think that these are values that help that help to conduce are conducive. But what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't blame one race or one people. That's not critical race. That's not what critical race theory does. Well, critical race theory actually doesn't blame for our own communities. Kenny, critical race theory actually doesn't blame a race at all. It de-emphasizes, uh, de-emphasizes individual racist people. It, That's it takes funny. that it totally away. It individual racist people, but it talks about race all the time. Kenny, I hope you appreciate the fact uh, that I am a university professor, that I have been teaching critical race theory since 2016, and that I'm currently a professor that teaches critical race theory. Critical race theory does not emphasize individual racist people. It de-emphasizes people, period. It de-emphasizes individual racist people, and it emphasizes systems, structures, statutes, institutions, laws, corporations that are engaging in systemic bias. And much of it is considered implicit because it has been historically ingrained into those institutional norms. I well, need I you to read up on CRT. I don't want to believe in any ideology that de-emphasizes the individual. Because in the end, everybody has their own choices and everybody has to make their own choices and take responsibility for their own choices. So I prefer to believe in something that actually emphasizes the individual. Well, let me that, ask you about the choices the of these companies. That have engaged. Let me ask you about the choices of these companies that engage in systemic racism. Um, let me give you one data set. Choices of who in these companies? 11.5% of job applicants of Asian descent receive callbacks when their resumes include references of ethnicity and race. Um, about 10% as it relates to black folks. So black folks, when they put down their race or ethnicity, they do not get as many callbacks. Um, the potential employers increase that by over 50% um, when you whiten the resume. Asians, uh, Asian Americans receive 21% uh, increase immediately if they simply changed their name or they took off a particular part of their name. It went up by 21% if they fully whitened their resume with the same credential and educational background. It went up by over 50%. Where does that come from? Yeah, and, and Asian Americans. By virtue of having an Asian name, get discriminated against in Harvard. You can have the exact same application, and if you have an Asian name, you're discriminated against relative to if you had a white name. Of course. So, so you agree that it comes now from systemic is, racism? Now that, well, what's the solution to this? What's but you do agree it, it comes okay, from systemic racism? Okay, we need to gender and victimize and say this is what we need to do. Not victimize. No, the solution you is we need to truth. we it's need to develop cultures of entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And demand our place at the table through our marriage. Demand your place at the table. What about policy reformation? What do you mean about policy reformation? When you say you just have to demand your place at the table, people who have been marginalized historically have been demanding for a very long time. I you believe, you okay, don't so get there just by demanding, you get there by changing policy. policy. This is what I believe in terms of policy. I believe in a colorblind meritocracy. I believe policy wise, you should craft structures in which name, race are excluded. This means stop taking race into account. You agree with critical race theory, Dan. (laughs) This means means treating people on their objective merit, on their objective. This is what I've always believed and this is what I I advocate for. When you're in a system, and thank you for saying that, Kenny, my producer say I have one minute. When you're in a system that does not agree with the ideology that you just said, because in a perfect world that is full, full of utopia, what you're saying is correct. However, we live in a world with extreme bias, racism, prejudice uh, behavior. In that world, you have to do very intentional things to correct those modes. You have to do things to correct them. Simply saying you should be um, judged or you should be looked at based on your background and education and nothing else does not actually provide a solution <laughs> to those who are already in power, to the rules that have been set, to the policies that are already codified and adversarial to those who have been historically marginalized. Simply saying do a better job does not work, brother. I'll just have the last word on this, which is I don't mean to say just be judged. I mean to say craft structures in which race is not a factor, in which you can minimize the impact of race by judging people on objective metrics. This is what I've always advocated for. This is why gifted and talented admissions 
should be about grades and test scores and should not be based on subjective holistic evaluations. This is what I believe for hiring, this is what I believe for promotion. That's what I believe. I don't Kidding. believe in the status quo and hopefully we can find common ground in that. We, we actually agree on more than what you think because you're, mm -hmm. you're literally talking about significant dynamics that connect back to critical race theory, but you haven't made the connection yet. I'm out of time, but what I wanna do is bring you back and let's dig into this subject in particular more. All right, I appreciate you being on the show. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kenny.